night, surely you realize he is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Amen. Uh, our, uh, our mission statement at our church is to see souls saved, life changing people enjoying God. If you don't enjoy your relationship with God, you're not going to serve him very long. Our vision statement is saving the American family one child at a time. Today, we spend a lot of money, a lot of energy, a lot of effort to make sure that kids have a great day today. And so we want you to make sure and stay and be a part of the festivity as soon as church is over with this morning. Um, well, two for two so far. Let me try one more, and then we'll get into the Word of God, okay? Mother walks in on Easter Sunday morning to wake up her son to go to church. He, he, she walks in, wakes him up, and he said, I'm not going to church today. And, and she said, what do you mean you're not going to church? He said, I'm not going to church for two reasons. He said, well, what are the two reasons you're not going to go to church today? He said, first reason is, nobody at that church likes me. The second reason that church is, I don't like, the second reason I'm not going is I don't like nobody at that church anyway. She said, well, there's two reasons why you're going to go to church today. And he said, okay, what is it? She said, the first reason is you're 49 years old, you're going to go to church. And, he, and she said, and the second reason is you're the pastor of the church, you've got to go. <laughs> Give God a hand clap, would you please? It is an exciting time. It is an exciting time. We see Bible prophecy being fulfilled around us like never before. We realize that we are in the most exciting, dangerous, frightening, exhilarating time that we could ever be in. It would be a terrible time today to be living today and not have the hope of the resurrected Christ. It would be terrible. I mean, I mean, it's terrible. We, we, are, we are in the middle of wars and rumors of wars. So I want to encourage you today to take note of what the Word of God says and let God minister to you today. Isaiah chapter 53. The Word will be on the screen behind me and you'll be able to see the Word while I read it. Matter of fact, they say if you see it and read it along while someone else reads, you'll remember 70% of it. So I want to encourage you to do that. He is despised and rejected of men. Old Testament, before Jesus ever came. A man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he bore our grief, he carried our sorrow, yet we esteemed him not. Stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was, for our, he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Anybody get any of that? Do you understand what the Word of God is? It's a guarantee. It's a contract signed by the blood of Jesus Christ. It is a sure contract. And what he said is that he, he's taken our grief. He's taken our sorrow. I can't tell you this. What the Bible said is cast your cares on him because he cares for you. And then the word said, and the word of God, verse 6 said, <clears throat> And we like sheep have gone astray, and have turned every man to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Every iniquity you've ever committed is laid on the heart of Jesus Christ. And so that's the reason we can have joy today, because we don't have to bear the sorrow. We can give it to him, and that's the reason it came. And then in the New Testament it said, in John 12 and 27, it said like this, Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause I came into this hour. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, I came to this world for this one purpose, to redeem mankind. Can I tell you, he didn't come to heal the sick, even though he did heal the sick. He didn't come to open the blinded eyes, even though he did come, even though he did open blinded eyes. He didn't come to do the miracles that he did. He came to redeem lost humanity. Amen. That was the whole purpose of him coming, amen? And so, well, all these, yes, that's all part of it, but I'm telling you the ultimate thing was that he was going to pay a price so you could be free, so you wouldn't have to live in the grief and the sorrow that, that he talked about, but you could live in the power and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. amen. This morning, I want to talk to you about three things this morning. What do you say? What do you say about this event? What do you say about these things going on? What did Jesus say about these events going on? What does the Bible say about these events going on? And the, and the conclusion is, what does USA Today say about these events? What does the newspaper say about these events? So I want you, if you will, to turn with me in the Word of God to Matthew chapter 27, verse number 24. Matthew chapter 27, verse number 24 is mankind. It's an individual, and his name is Pilate. And Pilate in this story is the governor of Judea. He is the man that is in charge of the events that are taking place around the crucifixion of Christ. He is doing everything he can to spare the life of Christ except for what he needed to do. And this is what it said. 
in Matthew chapter 24, verse number, or chapter 27, verse 24. And said, so when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing. In other words, there's a mob of people saying, crucify him, crucify him, and away with him. And the Bible said when Pilate saw that he had no ability to persuade the crowd what he needed to do, this is what Pilate does. This story may be more about you than about Pilate. Because what happened is, there's a whole group of people that are saying crucify him. And Pilate said that when he saw he couldn't prevail, but rather that turmoil was made, he took water, washed his hand before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. Anybody got that? He realized, number one, he was an innocent man, number one. Number two, he realized that he couldn't persuade the crowd. But what he did have was he had the ability to determine the outcome of the life of Christ. He, had, he was a man of power and authority. All he had to do was say, he's not going to be crucified on my watch. It's not going to happen. You understand that? So what does that mean to me? Can I tell you this? No matter what you think or believe, you have the power whether you crucify him afresh and new again. Matter of fact, said that when we sin, what we do is we crucify him afresh and anew again. So he said, I'm saying each one of us here today have to decide whether or not we're going to be Pilate. You know what Pilate said? I know he's a good man. I know he's the Christ. I understand that. But I'm just not going to be involved. Anybody got that? It, it, it's kind of where we are in the world today. We see what's happening, but we neglect to let our light so shine before men that they might see our good works and glorify our Father, which are in heaven. Amen. In other words, we take this apathetic, complacent stand that says exactly what Pilate did. Pilate had all power, all authority, all ability, and he does nothing with it. Absolutely nothing. Well, Pilate really didn't want to deal with him wrong, so he discovered that not only was Jesus of Nazareth, but he was of Galilee, and so he realizes across town there's a guy who named, whose name was Herod. Now, Herod was the guy that crucified John the Baptist. I mean, beheaded John the Baptist. And so he sends word and discovers. So this is what it does. In Luke 23 and 11, said, And when Herod was with his men of war, sent him at not, mocked him and arrayed him in a, in a gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate. Listen. The verses before this say that for a long time he'd been desirous to see Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus. Because he knew that what he was doing, he understood that. And then he comes to this place when he's around all of his peers. You understand that, right? You remember what it said? Herod was a man of war. and said all the other men of war, they were all there. And what he really wanted to know from Jesus was, is there a way? Is there an answer? But because all of his friends were there, he just didn't, he didn't go there. So what he does is he mocks him, he makes fun of him, and he sends him another way. I'm talking about what does mankind do? And two more verses, then we'll move on. Here's the other two verses. In Proverbs chapter 26 and 13 said, The slothful man has said, There is a lion in the street. In verse number 22, or excuse me, Proverbs 22 and 13 said, The slothful man said, There's a lion, there's a lion without, and I will be slain in the street today. What the slothful man said is, I know what I need to do, but I'm not going to do it. You understand that, right? That's what he's saying in Proverbs. I know exactly what I'm responsible for. I know exactly what I'm supposed to do, but I'm just not going to do it. As a matter of fact, he, he, what he does is he knows about Christ. He understands about Christ. He got Christ down. He knows all about it. But what he's saying is, I'm just not going to be involved. I'm not going to be responsible for that. I will let somebody else take care of that. I'm not going to do that. Listen, in the year 2000, there were 50 books written about happiness. You got that? In the year 2000, there were 50 books written about happiness. In the year 2008, there were 4,000 books written about happiness. So we say, I'm saying the world's looking for happiness. They're looking for something that would be an answer. They're looking for somebody that can tell them that there's joy unspeakable and full of glory and the half has never yet been told. I, I read this. During the Tang Dynasty, the emperor of China received a gift. And the gift that he received was four fingers of Buddha. And what happened was every 30 years during the Tang Dynasty, they would pull the fingers out. They'd have celebration for days and days and days because they had something that represented Buddha. And all the Buddhists loved it. Well, what happened was in life, you know how life is, they forgot all about the four fingers. They forgot about them. They had them buried deep down where they'd be safe. And, and, and so they forgot about them until 1981, they found the four fingers again. And now what happened is, according to what I read, is that people all over the world will come to this place and look at those four fingers. They said it is sensational. It's marvelous. It is tremendous. Say so what I'm saying. I'm saying if anybody tells you they got the hand of Christ, don't believe it. 
Anybody tell you they got the foot of Christ, don't believe it. Because it's not so. What, what you're saying is, I'm saying God is a resurrected God. I'm saying God isn't in the dead. He's not in the grave. He is alive, amen. He is alive, amen. Christ is risen, amen. I read a story about this uh, local pastor who was challenged to a debate by a local agnostic, a, lo- a local atheist. And he was challenged this debate to, to prove that God was alive. And so they, everybody met at the local high school. It was a big deal. All the people were there. They were all excited about the event. And so what happened was the atheist, the leader of the atheist party is standing up before all the people. And there he stands. And everybody's watching the event. And the pastor comes in, takes his place on the platform. And he does something so unique. Everybody doesn't know what's going on. He peels an orange. And after he peels the orange, he eats the orange. And after he eats the orange, he says to the atheist, he said, how did that taste? He said, well, I don't know. He said, I never tasted it. And he said, no, and you'll never know until you taste it and realize that God is good. Can I tell you something on the Sunday morning? Only when you taste the living Savior, only when you understand that God is alive, amen. amen. Only then do you really understand what God's all about. God is about saving souls and making a difference in your life, amen. amen. The writer of John chapter 7, verse number 17, said like this. Therefore does my Father love me. Because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay down on myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up. This is the command that I've received by my Father. Can I tell you what they thought? They thought that the Roman soldiers had apprehended Christ and took him to the Sanhedrin. And, and, and we understand that that would look like on the outside, but Christ said, you don't understand. I can call legions of angels at this moment. Nobody takes my life. I lay it down because I knew that one Sunday morning in Adairsville, Georgia, there'd be somebody there that needed to know Jesus Christ. So what he said is, I laid it down freely. I gave my life. Nobody took it. You, you, you know, if you look at the cross and you, and you look at the crucifixion, you might think that somebody could do something. I'm telling you, nobody could do anything. God laid his life that you wouldn't have to die in sin, but you could live an abundant life with the power and the anointing of Jesus Christ. God doesn't want you to live in captivity or caged by sin. He wants you free, amen. Yeah. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise, amen. Philippians 2 and 8 said like this, And being formed in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. Of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee shall bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. There, there was a third grade Sunday school teacher. And she, she was a very talented teacher, but in her class, there was a little boy named Philip who had Down syndrome. She was such a creative teacher that all the class loved Philip and just made him like one of the other children. On a particular Sunday, which was Easter Sunday, she brought a whole group of plastic, large plastic eggs. She brought them in and she said, now this morning, Easter Sunday, we're going to go out in the yard and we're going to look around and we're going to find something that represents life. And what you'll do is when you find it, you'll just put in this egg and then we'll come back in the class and we'll talk about what you think life is. So each one of the children, they went out in the yard. They was all excited. They were happy. They were fired up. And they came back in a few minutes and one of the, one of the children had an uh, a leaf in it. One of them had a piece of grass. One of them had some flowers. One of them had uh, a part of a twig. And so they all had it. And then when it came Philip's turn, he opened up his plastic egg and it was empty. And all the children looked at Philip and said to Philip, Philip, you're supposed to put something in there. And he said, no, no, I was supposed to, what rep- I was supposed to have what represents life. He said, for me, the empty tomb represents life. Can I tell you something on this morning? It's an empty tomb. There's not anybody there. He is risen. I said, he is risen. No, no, he is risen. Amen. He is risen. Abraham Lincoln died in 1865. Assassinated. They, there was a rumor going around immediately that somebody had stole the body of Abraham Lincoln. He died in the spring of, of uh, 1865. In December 1865, they, they took his body out. They looked in the, in the coffin to make sure it was Abraham Lincoln. They did it in, in 1865 because somebody said they stole the body. 
They did it again in 1871. They did it again in 1874. They did it again in 1887. You know that? And the last time they brought his body out was in 1901. Can I tell you this? Every time they brought his body out, Abraham Lincoln was still in the in coffin. Amen. I'm telling you, there's only one person that I know that is raised from the dead, and that's Jesus Christ. And he's hope for you. He's hope for you. He isn't dead. He is alive. He is alive. The reason we celebrate Easter is because there is an empty tomb. There is an empty tomb. I heard a story about a church, and the church had children in the church, and one of the little children in the church was Brian. Humor story. Bear with me one more time. Humor story. Brian was uh, five years old, and everybody loved him, and he wanted to be in the Eastern place so bad, he finally conned the, the, the director of the play to let him in the play. Anybody here ever been in a program like that? Anybody here ever forgot the words? Anybody ever forgot your words? He was five years old. He had one line. His line was say, he is not here, he is risen. You understand? So he stands up before the whole group, and, and he realized his line is say, he's not here, he is risen, right? And so he stands there, and he freezes. Anybody ever froze? The director of the play whispers to him, he is not here, he is risen. Brian is so excited because now he realizes what he's supposed to say. And, he's, and the mom said, when it's your part, say it as loud as you can. So Brian opens his mouth and said, he is not here. He is in prison. <laughs> Sometimes we just don't get it right. But Jesus has got it right because he loves you with all of his heart. He loves you with everything there is within him. Jesus loves you. So what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about this event called Easter and the resurrection? What does the Bible say about that? The ladies were going down to the tomb to prepare his body. They went down to the tomb, and something happens. When they get there, there are two angels. The commentator said, because, you know, the Word of God said that they had on white apparel. The commentator said it was like lightning. They were wearing lightning. That, that's what it was like. It was like, wow, man. It, it was something they'd never seen before. So these two ladies, this is where we're at. And these two ladies in verse chapter, chapter 24, verse number 5 said, and they were afraid. I guess we'd all be afraid, right? And bowed their face to the earth, and they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was with you in Galilee? saying the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified in the third, and the third day raised again. And they remembered his words. There's a pastor whose name is W. E. Sangster. W. E. Sangster was a famous pastor in England. And Pastor Sangston contacted a disease in the 50s that was a disease that attacked his muscular system and, and it caused his muscles to deteriorate and degenerate. The last Easter he was alive, he was able to write through the help of other people. And this is what he wrote on his last Easter. He said, he said, it is a terrible thing to wake up on Easter Sunday morning and not have a voice to shout that he is risen. And then he wrote, but it would be worse still, have a voice and not want to shout he is risen. This morning I got to ask you something. Do you want to shout he is risen? Or is it just a holiday? Is it just about eggs and the fancy things? Or is it about Jesus Christ? Conclusion. Here's my conclusion. Matthew 24, verse number 4 said this. And Jesus said, watch out that no one deceive you. For many will come in my name saying, I am Christ. I am the Messiah. And will deceive many. And you hear wars and rumors wars. But see that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is yet to come. Nations rise against nation, kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be famine and earthquake in various places. And all of these are the beginning of birth pains. And then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and be put to death. And you'll be hated of all nations because of me. Anybody realize that? The name of Christ has to be the most hated name in the entire world right now. And this was written over 2,000 years ago. Then you'd be handed over to be persecuted and be put to death and be hated by all nations because of me. You'd be handed over 
to be persecuted and be put to death. And at that time, many, and at the time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and, be, and hate each other. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Because of iniquity, because of increase of wickedness, love of many will wax cold. But the one who stands firm until the end will be saved. I said I was going to say, what does the newspaper say? Can, can I tell you, you probably already know this. Last Sunday morning, Palm Sunday in Egypt, there were 44 Christians that were killed. You know that? No doubt about it. This is USA Today on Monday. Monday, Monday. Look, 44 Christians were killed. Several people were uh, badly injured. And if you look over here on the side, there's a side little bar here. And this is what it said. Terrorism is a grim reality for Coptic Christians. Now, what are we going to do about this? What can we do about it? It's a grim reality. It's just how it is in our world today. If five years ago somebody had told you that 44 Christians would be killed because they were Christians, you say, ah, that ain't going to happen. And if it does happen, you need to know we'll do something about it. But it happened. And at the same time, it's happening everywhere. Christians are being persecuted and hated, even in America. And so what's all that mean to me? It means it's time for us as a church to realize it's time to put on the wedding garment. It's time to have our relationship with God, what it needs to be. Because this is what the Bible said. In a twinkling of an eye, Jesus Christ is coming again. My question to you is, are you ready to go? Are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you ready to see Jesus? That's my question. I picked this up the other day. I read this. And I want to share it with you. Picture with me one person standing for you at four different stages of his life. And God's Holy Spirit dealing with that person. This is what it said. The Spirit once came to an innocent child and pleaded in tender tones, Little one, let me come into your heart and let me make it forever my own. Sweet, sweet Spirit, the child replied, I'm too young to pray. Childhood is only for fun and play. So some other day, sweet spirit, I'll ask you to come and stay. The spirit returned to a tall, fair youth and said with a more urgent term, tone and pleaded, the harvest is ripe. The work is to be done. God's cause is calling you. Sweet spirit, he cried, I should obey, but the pleasure of life, they hold me its way. Some other day, some other day, I bid thee to stay. Spirit pleaded with a torn, worn man, make haste while God's grace shall last. The silver is tinged in thy locks of brown, thy years are slipping by fast. Oh, Spirit, he, he replied, I should obey, but I'm too busy and I'm too tired to pray. Some other day, some other day, when I have more time, I'll bid thee to stay. The old man now leans on a feeble staff with a quiver and a bit of a sass a bitter sass i wasted a lifetime in sin he cried and now and now i'm going to die the spirit just slighted has gone away and for him there is no hope there is no god there is no other day the holy spirit is gone to stay would you stand with me please Nobody on planet Earth can make you. Nobody on planet Earth wants to make you. It has to be a decision that you want to make. So let me ask you something. Where are you at? Are you the tear, tall, slender youth? Are you the one that's hair's kind of getting a little gray? Are you so busy you just don't have time to pray? Jesus is coming. But what's going to be staggering is that he gave us this day. God gave us this day to determine what we would do with Christ. Pilate said, I'm just going to wash my hands of this guy. Herod said, oh, don't you understand? 
But you understand, these are my buddies, these are my friends. I can't really make a decision for Christ in front of everybody. On this Sunday morning, it's really about where you are. Would you bow your heads and spend a couple minutes in prayer, talk with God while we sing this verse in this course of this song.